Hello, welcome to the 13th session of Systematic Theology in Liberty Theological Seminary. And on this lecture, we're going to deal with the subject of angelology. Very interesting subject to many people. And before we begin, let's ask God's blessing upon this teaching this morning. Father, we thank you that you have made provision in many ways for our lives, not the least of which you have set angels to guard our way at times to bring your message to us. But we thank you that you have placed us in a position according to your word in which we are placed even higher than angels. For you said in your word that we shall judge them. But we thank you more than all that by your grace we have been saved. We have been lifted up out of sin and darkness into the light of your eternal glory. Now I pray that your spirit should attend our way as we study this subject. Keep us from the desire to know things that you haven't desired we know. And inform us by a study of your word and by the activity of your spirit what we must know about heavenly beings and heavenly forces. But we trust in your divine power and your sovereignty above all earth and life for our refuge and for our strength and for our final deliverance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we are talking about this mad matter of angels today. We're not going to be talking about the bad angels. We'll save that to another time when we deal with the whole subject of Satan and demonology. But we do want to talk about the good angels. And first of all, let's take a look at the words that are used. And it's mainly just one word, um, Angelos, and I'm using a combination of Greek and, and English letters here. That's not good. Let's see. This is the uh, uh, this is the uh, what it looks like in Greek. This is the way it would be transliterated into English. The same word, Angelos, and we get our word angels from that. Now. The word angel in itself, or angelos, uh, simply means messenger. Uh, it can mean even a human messenger. In fact, in much of classical Greek history, it is used to describe uh, just plain messengers, messengers of generals or whatever. However, I must say that most of the occasions of its use in the, in the Bible have to do with heavenly messengers. That's the preponderance of their use. Now, let's take a look at several passages in the scriptures that speak of their mission, the mission of angels. So if you're keeping, as you're keeping your notes, this will be the first major heading after the terminology. So this is their mission as God's messengers. Now we start out with Job chapter 38 verses 4 through 7. You recognize this passage, one of my favorite chapters in the book of Job. In fact, it's the first time that God really speaks uh, at length, God has some things to say in the early chapters as he's setting up Job's condition. But throughout most of the book of Job, we have a, rec a recording of the uh, meanderings and the philosophizing of these men who are gathered around Job, Job's so-called friends. And finally, God gets tired of all of the noise and the confusion and the conversation that doesn't seem to go anywhere. And in the beginning of chapter 38, it says that the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Boy, that doesn't describe a lot of the, of the talk and the thinking that goes on in the world today. And then God goes on to say, Now gird up your mind or gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you and you will instruct me. Now, of course, God is sort of tongue-in-cheek here. If God could have said to be to have a tongue in his cheek. And so God begins to ask him a series of unanswerable questions in verse 4. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Now, if you've read the rest of the book of Job, you realize these men made a lot of pronouncements about God and about what God does and what God thinks and how God operates. And God's setting the record straight. You know, he has a way of doing that. And when he does, you know, it's been set straight. But he said, who set the measurements of the earth since you seem to know so much? Or who stretched the line upon it? 
or what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Now that seventh verse is the one I was getting to because that phrase, sons of God, is another uh, phrase that indicates angelic forces and, uh, or the angelic persons right here. And so their mission as God's messengers, they were singing together when God created the earth. So apparently they were created at some point before the universe. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now their mission, the book of Revelation tells us throughout that their mission in heaven is to praise God. We see many pictures of angels in heaven who are gathered around the throne and they are praising God. Now, another mission of theirs is to do the will of God uh, in various ways and to behold His face. In Psalm 103, 20, it says, Bless the Lord, you His angels, mighty in strength, who perform His word, obeying the voice of His word. They are created to obey the voice of the Lord exactly. They don't have choice anymore. Apparently, at some time, they had the same choice that man had and some of them chose to disobey God. But on the other hand, nowadays, apparently they don't have a choice, and they worship God, they do His will, and according to Matthew 18.10, that's Matthew 18.10, according to that passage, Jesus talking about the little children, and He said, Their angels behold the face of My Father constantly in heaven. And so the angels... <clears throat> are closely connected with God. The whole emphasis is that they are His messengers. Job 38, 7 says they accompanied God in creation. They helped God in the providential ordering of His affairs. In Daniel 12, 1, the book of the prophet Daniel 12, 1, it speaks about uh, one of the archangels there. In fact, there's a lot that Daniel has to say about him in chapter 10. But it says in the prophecy, chapter 12, verse 1, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. Back in, verse, or back in chapter 10, it spoke about after Daniel had prayed and really sought God for the condition of his people. Then after a number of days, Michael came to him and said he'd been hindered by the prince of Persia for 20-some 20, 20 days. But he finally, he finally had come. And so, apparently, there was a demon prince that was over the affairs of the nation of Persia. And Michael himself was sent from the heavenly shores as God's messenger to uh, combat this prince over, over these things. So, apparently, the angels have something to do with God's ordering of affairs in the earth among the nations. Psalm 91. Let's turn to Psalm 91. Psalm uh, Verse 1, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings may you seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the struck destruction that lays waste at noon. And it goes on to say that he shall give his angels charge concerning you. And so they're active in taking care of God's anointed. They declare God's word in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. We have the angel announcing the word of God. Luke 16, 22, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the angels had Lazarus uh, in his bosom or taking him up into heaven uh, to be in the bosom of Abraham. So uh, the angels in their mission as God's messengers, they do a number of things uh, to carry out the will of God as, as concerns us. And of course, we've already seen in chapter 12, verse 1 of Daniel, that the angels there stood watch or stood guard over God's earth in various areas. Now, let's talk in the second case about the relationship of the angels to Christ's earthly ministry. Now, of course, we re remember that they were there at the Annunciation. The angel 
announced the birth of Jesus to Mary, spoke to Joseph, and he, the angel was present at nativity, the nativity of Jesus, great hosts of them in the heavens, and then at the resurrection, there were angels that ministered to him, and at the ascension, angel forces were there. Now, throughout the entire intermediate part of Jesus' life and ministry, there were only two uh, appearings, apparently, that were significant. One was, of course, at the temptation. Jesus went through the 40 days temptation uh, by Satan, and at the end of that period, it said the angels came and ministered to him. And then, of course, in Gethsemane, there were angelic forces around. In fact, the Bible tells us that he could have called legions of angels. I don't know why he needed all those. Some of those angels are pretty powerful. One of them could have wiped the whole crowd out around Jerusalem in one, in one swipe at one time there. But he could have called 12 legions of angels. A legion, a Roman legion, uh, comprised something between three and 4,000 troops at that time. So you're talking about a lot of people, 30 to, 30 to 40,000, I'm not saying people, but angels. Now, this being the case, Jesus being the Son of God and angels being the messengers of God, we might ask the question, why were, not there, why were there not more angels involved during the life of Jesus? In fact, a lot of people would like to see that there were more angels because then they could say, well, Jesus did what he did by angelic forces. He was the Son of God and his supernatural power was brought into play uh, by the help of angels. But the truth of the matter was that most of what Jesus did, he did not do with angels because he had to do it alone. In order for us to realize what he said uh, in John's gospel, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. So Jesus had to sort of go it alone. There were times when angels came at these very specific times. Now, before we go too much further here, I want to recommend a couple of books to you on the subject of angels. Uh, and they're both popular books, one of them even more popular than the other, I should say, and I don't mean by that that it sells more copies, although it has sold a lot. But they're not written in a very theological language that is very uh, technical theological language. The first, of course, is a, very cl is a classic on the subject in recent years, if something written just recently could said to be a classic, I think it will be. And it's a book by Billy Graham on angels, the secret agents of God. And uh, this is in a new expanded and revised version, I understand. And it's published by uh, Word Books. So I'd recommend this because it, it doesn't get fancy. It doesn't have a lot of speculation about angels, but it gives you what you can know. And that's what we're trying to do in this lecture today. Now, there's another book that's been written just recently. It's been quite popular, and uh, it's written by, let's see, Frank uh, Peretti, and it's called This Present Darkness, and it's been quite popular. I'll have to warn you that it is uh, fiction, although from a theological standpoint, I don't have much problem with what he says or how he depicts these characters, but it's a compelling book, and I'll promise you if you have any interest in these kinds of things at all, you'll find that you'll spend most of the night <laughs> reading this. It's very difficult to lay down. Uh, I understand that he's got a sequel to this book for those who are devotees of this kind of, of uh, writing that's supposed to come out in August. But uh, these will give you some idea. I think uh, one of the things that is a sobering realization in Frank Peretti's book is how much angels depend upon our prayers and our prayer life to be free to act within the bonds and limitations that God has laid upon them. All right, now let's go on and see how angels, we've understood how they are related to God. Let's see how they are related to the church or to, in a sense, to us, but mainly in technical sense, to the church. Uh, in Acts 5.19, in Acts... Chapter 5, verse 19, if you'll turn there in your Bibles. Uh, and I'm having a hard time turning these new pages here. All right, here we are. Acts 5, 19. 
And of course, that's the account of the angel of the Lord that came during the night and opened the prison gates to let Peter out. And so these angels were sent by God to assist the church in this particular period of its, of its life. Peter was in prison. Uh, Acts 10.3, uh, in the house of Cornelius, an angel came to Cornelius. And uh, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision the angel of the Lord who had just come to him and said, Cornelius. In this case, this is the bringing of the gospel in the early chapters of Acts to the Gentiles. Cornelius was what we might call a God-fearer. It's a technical term that indicates a Gentile who has become enamored with the Hebrew religion. And uh, although he doesn't become a Jew, because you have to be circumcised and go through certain other rituals, but he comes, becomes a believer in the Hebrew God, that is Yahweh. And in many cases, uh, they undergo some teaching. They may even have copies of the scriptures. In fact, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch who was returning from Jerusalem was, was such a man. He was a God-fearer uh, when the first evangelist, Philip, caught up with him. And he even had a copy of the scroll of Isaiah and was having a little trouble understanding it. But he wouldn't have had that had he not uh, made some commitment to the beliefs of the Jews and become what they called a God-fearer, a believer, though he wasn't a member himself either of the Jewish nation. Now, they assist the church then. Uh, they're going to be very important in the end time. In Revelation 7-1, we find the angels having a lot to do with a lot of the things that are going to happen in the end time, and God's going to use them in increasing measure as demonic forces, demonic angelic forces, began to build up their power and their influence on the face of the earth. Now, Matthew 13, 41 and through 49, Jesus is talking about the end time. Now, of course, uh, in some of this, he's talking about something that will happen very shortly, but he says in the end time, the angels are going to come and separate out the sheep from the goats that there's going to be a separation in time, and the angels are going to be the agent of that. Paul says something interesting in Corinthians, however, that despite the exalted nature of the angels, despite their power, despite their close connection with God, he says that in the end, we are going to judge angels. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more. What do you mean, judge angels? Well, it indicates that we will have authority over them in that time. Now, we've got to be very careful here because there's a teaching going around today that we have authority over angels now and we can direct them, and that's simply not indicated in the Scripture. Let's go and talk about their nature a little bit. Now, uh, angels are represented variously, but they are sexless. That is, they may be represented as a man, but they cannot procreate. Uh, they are created and they are in a fixed state. They are in an eternal state. But mostly the Bible describes them in terms of their relationship with God. So despite what anybody tells you, an angel is not going to cohabit with a woman uh, or anything else. And I know that's one of the theories that we'll deal with a little bit later on in another connection in theology about the sons of God and the daughters of men and so forth on the face of the earth. But uh, they have no sex. Uh, they're just called angels. In Psalm 104, four, they're called angels his angels. And I think that's an important corrective. They're not our angels in the sense that we control their movements or we direct their movements. They are God's messengers and whatever happens by way of angels we can't control. It comes from God. In other words, God gives the orders of the day. He administers. He puts out the job descriptions for his angels. Now it is true that Hebrews 1.14 talks about them as ministering angels. He says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? So they are, though they are they're vitally connected with God, they are administratively connected with God. Nevertheless, he sends them out as ministering spirits to us. They're sometimes referred as the heavenly ones, the holy ones. When you see that in the scriptures, the sons of God even. Let's take a look at a couple of these passages in uh, Psalm 29, 1, Psalm 29, 1, we find such a, such a reference there. A 
Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Now this is a picture of the heavenly worship scene around the throne. In Job chapter 5, verse 1, it speaks of the sons of God. It's quite evident it's talking about heavenly, uh, a heavenly scene. It's not earthly men. In fact, Satan is called one of the sons of God. It's interesting that he has access, at least in some way, to the, to the divine chamber, at least to come and argue about something, particularly over the nature of Job and what he's going to do to him. But uh, these passages talk about the sons of God and these holy ones, these divine ones. Uh, verse 6 uh, in, in the same psalm refers to that again. Now, it's apparent that they can take on human form. Sometimes they appear with great wings, and of course all of us uh, marvel at the little angels in the Christmas plays with their little flappy wings and whatever we have to make, make out of them. But uh, most of us understand that angels fly, and to do that, we think you have to have wings. I don't know why we don't think they can't have propellers or jet propulsion or whatever or some other kinds of transportation, but that's traditionally what we have seen. And, of course, the Bible refers to some forms of angelic forces as having wings in the book of Ezekiel, also in the book of Revelation. Uh, I don't know that they need wings to get where they go because they dwell in a spiritual uh, realm in heaven. Now let's talk just a little bit more about the angels' relationship to us. Now it's true they are of another sort of creation. And it may not be accurate to give them all kinds of um, human characteristics. In fact, as Ezekiel describes some of these creatures, and in the 10th chapter of Revelation, when some of them are described, uh, it's, very, well, it's hard to understand what they're talking about or even to picture these awesome, awesome creatures. But I think when they appear, as they do in other passages of the Scripture, these appearances, of course they have to appear in some form, and why not in the appearance of a man? Now, they appear to protect us at times. Matthew 18.10, when Jesus talked about the angels of the little children, and I love that passage, that they have angels. And some of them need them more than others. And we talk about guardian angels. But these angels are always holding the little children up in the face of, of the Lord. It's interesting, in Acts 12.15, when Peter got free from jail and came to the doorway of the house where the Christians were meeting, or the early church was meeting in there, uh, uh, they didn't think it was uh, Peter himself. They said, well, it's his angel. So there was at least some idea that the Christians had angels that watched over them in that time. Now, when we're saved, as I mentioned earlier, we are raised above the angels in status. 1 Corinthians 6, 3, Paul says that, and we are going to judge them. Now, before we leave that, that uh, passage, there's a passage in the, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament that is rather curious, and I'm not going to exegete it particular because it is rather obscure, but I'm just going to call it to your attention. And we mentioned about judging angels. Well, why, how can you judge an angel? Uh, Job 4.18 says something curious. Um, see if I can find this uh, passage here. Um, he says, He puts no trust even in his servants, and against his angels he charges error. Well, that's peculiar. You mean the angels are in error? Well, it doesn't mean just the bad angels because it's very clear from the context he's talking about angels, uh, his angels, not the ones that have rebelled against him, but those that serve him against his, against his, his servants. And uh, so that may illustrate something from the Old Testament or give us a basis upon which to believe that we're going to judge angels. Now, don't ask me to, to increase that because the Scriptures really don't say anything about upon what basis we shall judge angels or where they made their errors. But uh, they're not faultless, at least, in God's, God's point. Now, whether it involves sin or not, that's another matter. Now, let's take a look at the organization 
or the orders of the angels. It's apparent from several passages in Scripture that there's some kind of hierarchy of angels. And the highest order, uh, and we'll put them on the board up here, the highest order of angels is probably the archangels. We don't know from Scripture of but, uh, I think, three, three archangels. And uh, of course, uh, the one we've, one we've already mentioned there was Michael, who was involved with Daniel. And he was the archangel that came to his or and, and this means, the word Michael means he who is like God. He who is like God. Now, there's references to Michael in, in Revelations 12, 7 and in Daniel 12, 1. He's the great prince, he's called. Now, there's another uh, archangel, of course, that we're familiar with, and that's Gabriel. And you remember that Gabriel came on the scene in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Annunciator. Luke 1, 26, Gabriel the Annunciator. Now there's another archangel, and that is Lucifer, who was the angel of light. And of course you know that he fell. We don't know when he fell, and we'll talk about that maybe just a little bit later. But he was called the Communicator. And uh, there's some teaching abroad today that Lucifer had uh, instruments, musical instruments, hanging from his body. There's not much scriptural basis for that. It's an assumption. Uh, it was that he did lead in the praise of God before he fell, but uh, we don't know much more about him. Now, he is called a cherub also. Uh, that kind of goes against the grain of popular theology. We think of cherubs as these cute little fat uh, pink babies with wings that flit around on our greeting cards and in some other kinds of illustrations. But the truth of the matter is that, uh, that he was called a cherub. And the cherubim, by the way, the I am, uh, indicates the plural uh, of the word cherub. Now, there are other angels that are named that probably uh, would fall under the category of the archangels but they're not named in Scripture, and we get them from the apocryphal books, mostly from the book of Tobit. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we don't accept the apocryphal books, those books between the Old and New Testament and some, some old Bibles, family Bibles. And so there are several others that are named in the apocryphal books. I won't put them up here, but I'll just give you the, the word here. It's Raphael it was one of them. In fact, he is said to be one of the seven angels that are before God listed in Revelation 8.2. Then there's Uriel, spelled U-R-I-E-L. And then there is Jeremiel, J-E-R-E-M-I-E-L. And these are additional high-ranking, probably archangels uh, that are mentioned in the apocryphal books. <clears throat> now, Let's turn for a moment to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and we'll be there for just a little while, because in this passage, Paul refers to orders of angelic forces. In fact, a little bit later on in Ephesians, he gives it a little bit more clearly. And uh, in verse 21 of chapter, chapter 1, he says, talked about Christ being placed at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion. Now, this is generally thought of as being the order of angelic beings, both good and bad. In fact, in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, a little bit further over, after he's talking about the, uh, well, he talks about all the, uh, the demonic forces uh, in there, and he talks about God being lifted up. Christ being lifted up uh, above these. And you have what is called these principalities, powers, dominions, and forces in that order. Now, I think you have in your notes probably this order. The principalities are probably uh, great demon generals. And by the way, the book that I mentioned by Frank Peretti, This Present Darkness, has, uh, he names a number of these. Of course, they're fictitious names. 
uh, of these principalities and these powers, but you see the level, it's a fictitious representation, but you see the various levels and the hierarchies and how they're limited from operating outside of their special sphere. But probably the principalities are the chief, they're the five-star generals of the uh, demonic forces. Uh, and also the archangels would probably be uh, a principality on the good side. Powers would probably be those, uh, those spirits that are over continents. Dominions would probably be those powers that have responsibilities over kingdoms. And then the forces or the authorities would probably be the foot soldiers, the common demons that most of us run into at various times. I doubt seriously that many of us have run into uh, an archangel. I doubt seriously that many of us have run into much more than the foot soldiers as far as demonic forces. A lot of people talk about dealing with uh, Satan. Well, if you ever dealt with him, you would know it. He's not going to waste his time on most of us. He's interested because, after all, Satan is not omnipresent. I think that comes as a shock to a lot of people, but he is not. And therefore, his ability to be in several places or to transcend time and space is not as God is. So that's some limitations on him. Now, there are other types of, of uh, angelic forces. I mentioned them. The cherubim, these are the covering cherubs, the one that guarded Eden, that God placed after man sinned. That was a cherub, and he was placed there to guard the way into the garden. Now, also, those cherubs or those angelic forces that were on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, and on the curtains in the tabernacle and later on on the temple of Solomon, these were cherubs. Uh, they adorned Solomon's temple in various ways. There were depictions of these cherubs. And of course, those uh, angelic forces in Ezekiel's vision were referred to as cherubs too. Now, the other type is called the seraphim, and they're only mentioned one place in the scriptures, and that is in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 and 6. You remember Isaiah's experience in the temple. And it's obvious then this, as God pulled back the curtain not only of the temple, but he pulled back the curtain of time and eternity and let Isaiah see into the very throne room of God that there were angels there and there were seraphims that were leading heaven in worship. And they also were given the task of purifying God's servants for acceptable servant. It was one of the seraphims that flew off, or the seraphim that flew off and picked up a coal all the, off the altar and purified the lips of Isaiah. Now, we have pretty well exhausted the scriptural references to angelic forces. Uh, there are some appearances of angelic beings or divine beings, we should say. Uh, for instance, before... Uh, Gideon, some feel like that was an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, a pre-Bethlehem appearance, a theophany of God, and the one who appeared before Moses. Uh, but we'll not get into that just here. But we've pretty well exhausted what the scriptures have to say. Now let's take a look at the history of the treatment of angels uh, throughout the, the history of the church. In the ancient period, <clears throat> there, most of the early Christians believed in good and bad angels. Uh, probably <clears throat> most of the, <clears throat> excuse me, most of the intellectual thinking uh, that dominated the early period was that of the Gnostics. Now this is pretty far off base. <clears throat> excuse me, the Gnostics, who were thoroughly Greek-oriented in their philosophy, who were a strong influence in early Christianity. It's interesting that a lot of Gnostic, uh, Gentile, uh, Greek philosophical beliefs are still hanging around as vestiges in modern American or world Christianity. But to the Greeks, <clears throat> they believe that the God of the Old Testament was to be identified with a bad spirit. They rejected, for the most part, the God of the Old Testament. In fact, one of the early church fathers in the second century, Martian, <clears throat> rejected the whole Old Testament because he didn't believe that God, uh, the, the real God, the, the transcendent God, would be that much involved in, <clears throat> in the earth and in the things that went on there. And they really identified the God of the Old Testament 
uh, as a demiurge, D-E-M-I-U-R-G-E. -E. And uh, they oppose the God of the Old Testament with the God of the Gnostic, uh, the, uh, the good God, they said. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the board here for a moment, and I'll try to illustrate some of this in a kind of a physical diagram. Remember in another discussion we had that the Greeks believed that the transcendent God, the God above all others, that prime mover, that first cause, was utterly transcendent. He was unapproachable. He could not <clears throat> be reached by man. In fact, they went so far as to say that this God was so transcendent that there was no way that he could touch material uh, being. And so there was a, an essential disconnection between this God and his created earth. And so they developed the theory that <clears throat> this God sent out many emanations, uh, eons and eons of emanations, successive emanations, uh, resulting in uh, a way that God could, by means of these eons, he created the earth, he did all of these things, but there was no essential connection then between the earth and between the transcendent God. Now these eons, they felt like were spiritual beings, or angels, if you will. And they taught, of course, or their worst heresy was that they taught that Jesus was one of these eons or one of these emanations of power and light from God. He was the highest of all of these eons, but he was, he was still a created being in that sense. And it was a result, it was the basis of one of the early heresies in the Old Testament. Now, the church fathers, however, apart from the Gnostic philosophy right here, the church fathers in the main, in the ancient period before the Middle Ages, generally uh, were so caught up in the arguments over the nature of God and the nature of Christ in particular, and most of the early church councils dealt with uh, these aberrations or these heresies concerning the nature of Christ, uh, his dual nature, uh, and also the nature of the Trinity. And so they weren't caught up much in the speculation, the Gnostics, about these uh, emanations or these eons, uh, which they called angelic forces. Now, <clears throat> passing into the Middle Ages, I'd have to say that the beliefs about angelic forces in the Middle Ages <clears throat> uh, was, the speculation was rife. Uh, they believed, of course, that angels were created with the universe, and there's some disagreement among that, among the theologians today about that. Are angels, were they created at the same time God created the heavens and the earth? Or <clears throat> were they created at an earlier time? Well, there's some evidence for both. We don't really know. But they were created, according to the Middle, the middle Age theologians, and I don't mean those who were 50 years of age, but in, during the Middle Ages, they were created with fixed knowledge. Angels could not learn anything else. They were not like humans in that. They, they were given an effusion of knowledge at their creation. They operated within that knowledge, and that's all that they knew. They believed very heavily in guardian angels, but I'll have to say that most of the understanding, or I shouldn't say understanding, most of the, of the beliefs about angels did not come in the Middle Ages from the Bible, but it came from the writings of a 13th century poet named uh, Ali, uh, Dante Alighieri. Now, he was strongly influenced by Thomas Aquinas. He had read uh, the, the theology of Aquinas, and of course you realize that, that the Aquinas, or the Thomist uh, philosophy or theology, strongly influenced by the uh, ability of the human mind to reason out all of the things about God. And so, uh, he was an encouragement to men like Dante to take a few passages out of Scripture and then begin to reason and develop all of this um, multifarious uh, explanations of how angels and demons worked. And in fact, in his book, The Divine Comedy, probably the most famous of his books, uh, he descends by the help of a guide, a spiritual guide, into the depths of hell and he describes all of the circles of hell and all of the various things that went on in Hades. And I think most of that, most of our understanding today or our beliefs, even very especially popular beliefs, have been mostly influenced 
by the writings of Dante Alighieri. Now, Calvin had an objection to the emphasis uh, uh, and the speculation apart from the scriptural witness. And in fact, I think probably uh, going back to Luther, uh, Luther wanted to do away with a lot of it. But Calvin's objection was all of the speculation that took place around, these, uh, around this. Of course, you recall that in the Middle Ages, these doctors of divinity would spend time, as the expression goes, speculating on how many angels could dance on the head of a pen. Well, that's theology to no avail. It has no practical application in life. Now, during the Enlightenment, which took place beginning with the 1700s, beginning with the 18th century on to the present, they rejected most of the ideas of otherworldly creatures because the activities of the mind began to be more strong, and uh, they explained them away by saying, well, these are re relics of polytheism, that uh, this was a, the church just sort of took up uh, the old Roman gods and the old Greek gods and uh, gave them some kind of spiritual name, so angels really were concerned with that. And that, that characterized uh, the way they dismissed the whole angelic picture in that time. Now, in closing, let me just say something about the, uh, I mentioned it earlier in the lecture, <clears throat> about angels today. Uh, I was talking to Brother Ken here recently, Brother Ken Sumrall, and he had been somewhere and had been picked up by somebody at the airport at a place where he was teaching, and the man in whose car he was riding was talking about how good he felt because he had discharged his angels uh, in various areas to do certain things this day, that day, and the other, and that he felt sure that his was going to be a successful day because he had taken his angels and uh, given them their assignments for the day. And Brother Ken remarked about how uh, that built up <laughs> a defense in him and it, it, it had a reaction in his own heart and his own spirit at that time. And he came back and began to read the scriptures a little bit more closely to see whether such a thing was possible. He didn't think they were. Well, th this is not possible. It is true that we will judge angels. Probably in the heavenly realm, uh, we will have authority over angels. Uh, for what reason, I don't know at this time. But it is manifestly not true that today we have uh, authority over angels. It's not true that we are going to, that we have certain angels that have been assigned to us, despite what kind of programs you see on television. They are not at our beck and our command. They are guardian. Uh, they do watch over us. There are guardian angels, thank God. And some people say after certain days, I heard a man say one time, he said, I'm sure his guardian angel, when he got through with the end of that day, he sat down and wiped the sweat off his brow because he'd been working pretty hard that day. He'd been through several harrowing experiences. But that simply not, uh, doesn't mean that we control the movements of angels or we have any understanding of that. So uh, suffice it to say, in summing up the whole teaching, that the angels are God's messengers and he, they carry out His will in the earth. They get their instructions from Him. They are administered individually and in groups by Him. They are probably involved or created in certain hierarchies. Some have more power, more authority, more responsibility than others, but they listen constantly at the Word of God. Now, they are also gathered around the throne. They worship Him. They lead in heavenly worship. And uh, they're involved in that sort of activity. And they help us, perhaps. But I think we need to depend more upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, is not at our beck and call either. But He is the Godhead. He is that divine being that we interact with. We need to learn more about the Holy Spirit, not about angels. And I guess I might say that my interest in angelic forces has not been as great as it has been in other facets of Christian theology or in the Godhead. And it's simply for that reason that I know I don't control their actions. They're not uh, under my authority. And whatever they do is not with any control of mine. 
So why should I be concerned about it? There's nothing I can do or not do that's going to change what God says to do with them. Now, it, the main thing I must be concerned with is my relationship with God. <clears throat> Whatever the angels do are going to be at the behest of God. So therefore, I need to know more about God. I need to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to know more about the Holy Spirit. And if I know that, then... <clears throat> I'm in the right place, and whatever God does, whether it's by angelic force, whether it's by a direct application of his own power and his own, and his own personality, then that will just follow. So I don't have to be concerned about that. I don't have to be concerned about whether I'm stepping on demonic forces or spiritual forces like many people in the Near East are concerned about today because that's not a, that's not a concern of mine. So with that, let's just pray that God attend our way as we close out this session today on angelology. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you have promised in your word to attend our way, to strengthen us, to save us, and by whatever means you choose, whether it's angel forces, or whether it's by the direct exercise of your power, but we believe that your power comes through the Holy Spirit. And so we say, Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you afresh. We submit to you as the Godhead, as that person in the Godhead that is uh, interested and concerned with communication with the heavenly shore. Now we pray that uh, the angelic forces shall have power over the forces of darkness. We pray, we lift up, the Word of God. We lift up the name of God. We lift up the praise of God. And in so doing, I pray that you'll help us to pray constantly without ceasing in our spirits in order that angelic forces and all other forces that you have at your command, Father, may be able to operate freely in our lives and in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. We thank you for your love and your care. We thank you for your grace that is exhibited toward us in all ways. We thank you for the fact that we are redeemed. We have a place in your economy that not even the angels in heaven have because we can sing, I have been redeemed. That's something they can't sing. But as we gather around the throne in our mind's eye and by the Spirit, I pray that our course, our song, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb will join that great song of the angels in the heaven Thou art worthy, and so may we together with every force and every person and every angelic force be able to praise the living God in the heavens above. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hello, welcome to the 14th session, teaching session of Systematic Theology at Liberty Theological Seminary. In this session, we're going to be talking about the problem of evil and the nature of sin. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a way out of evil and out of sin, that we don't have to be cursed by its effects, we don't have to be condemned by its presence in our lives. We thank you that Jesus Christ made a way for us. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, we can be free from the effects of sin. Bless us as we undertake this study. May we not be burdened down with condemnation, but may true guilt, if necessary, arise, and the healing of the Spirit of God as we yield ourselves to your voice May it save us, may it cleanse us, and bring us into all righteousness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I guess I want to start off with this lesson with the problem of evil. And somebody said, well, what do you mean problem with it? We've got a problem with it when it affects me. But what do you mean the problem of evil? Well, 
The problem of evil is a theological problem, if you think about it. And I'm sure you have talked to many, talked to many people who wonder about the presence of evil. In fact, this is another way of approaching that antinomy between the sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, and the free will of man. Now, the secularists, when they use this so-called problem of evil, the humanist, they use it to show that all theistic positions are self-contradictory. You say there's a God of love, then why does he permit these things to happen on the face of the earth? Sometimes they will use it then, press the argument to show the non-existence of God or to argue against the Judeo-Christian concept of God. And this is the nature of the problem. Uh, this term evil is seen as a problem of the internal consistency of these beliefs that we have about God. And we're going to put these up on the screen here. If God is all-powerful and all-loving, then why does evil exist in a world created by such a God? Now let's review that again. This is the statement of the problem of evil. We believe that God, we express our belief that God is all-powerful. If He's a God at all, He's got to have power, and He must be all-powerful, or He's not a God. If God is all-loving, and we believe that He is because of His testimony to that, in fact, He is love itself, then how in the world do we explain evil if God created the world and He has all power to do what He wants to do and He loves His creation, He's constantly coming forth with love, how in the world do you explain evil? And that's the problem of evil that philosophers have argued about for many years. Theologians have had a number of different kinds of understandings of it and treatments of it and beliefs about the problem of evil. And we'll talk about some of those today. Now, I don't want to <clears throat> just give the impression that there's only one problem of evil and that's it. In fact, there are a number of them. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is the religious problem. That's the personal problem. You know, why me, Lord? <laughs> a lot of us have that problem. Uh, you know, why is this happening? Why doesn't God remove this thing that bothers me? What have, what have I done so bad? I think everybody who's listening to me uh, probably has had some period of time in your life when evil came into it, be it sickness, be it some kind of problem physically, uh, some kind of spiritual problem. And uh, to the best of your knowledge, you know, you were a saved person. You were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You were walking reasonably close, close to the Lord, uh, if I you might use that term. And you wondered, why has this fallen upon me? Well, a lot of it comes out of the idea that... Uh, uh, that's been promulgated by many religious teachers through the years, wrongly, I think, that, you know, if you sin, you catch a cold or something. It's very direct, you know. You do something bad, and immediately something bad happens to you. Well, that's not exactly true. But <clears throat> that is a problem. It's a personal problem, the problem of evil in my life. Why is it there? Or what have I done to deserve uh, such treatment at the hand of the gods or God? Now, another problem of evil is the theological problem, and that's the one that we talked about earlier. That's the basic problem, and that is why is there such moral evil in the world? Uh, you know, why, why do I simply fall into this? And there's natural evil, the corporate effect. How can you explain, you know? This was what the disciples said when they came to Jesus, and here's a bunch of worshipers in a group, and they were going to bring their sacrifices up in Samaria. And uh, Pilate uh, mingle or Herod mingle their blood with their sacrifice. How should such a terrible thing happen? You hear of old women being uh, mugged in churches, you know, and robbed and beaten. You say, how in the world can that happen in a, in a situation like that? Uh, the, the natural evil or the effect that evil all around us has upon everybody. Well, then there's another problem of evil uh, that touches us, and that is the degrees or the intensity of evil. You know, if God, why does God need so much evil in the world uh, to accomplish His purposes? Does He need that much? And we see so much evil. It's the intensity of it. If He uses it at all, and I'm not sure that He does in that sense, uh, why does He need so much of it? Why is it so, why are there so, such heinous 
crimes against humanity, uh, particularly in our own uh, this century. We've seen horrible examples of uh, inhumanity and demonic uh, power being exercised through human beings against large numbers of people. And then there is the so-called gratuitousness of evil, and you might want to get that spelled. It's a long word. The gratuitousness of evil. That means uh, the evil that occurs for no apparent purpose at all. It's just, it's just there. Uh, with no reason, no rhyme or reasons. Well, these are some of the other problems of evil that we have to grapple with, and I think if we understand what the Scriptures have to say about the origins of evil and the purpose of evil, and we'll move on into an understanding of sin and how that works in there. Now, one of the things we have to say about, about evil and trying to understand these problems that I talked about and I've just, uh, that I've just mentioned here is first of all we must be sure our perceptions about God are, uh, don't contain any internal uh, contradictions. They must be consistent. Uh, people believe some, some terrible things about God and as a result they don't understand about evil. Uh, for instance, many of you have had people come to you and say, well now you say God is so good, He's so loving and he's so powerful, then why does he permit little children to suffer? Why does he permit all these terrible wars? And why does he permit these terrible accidents when hundreds of people are killed? Well, my answer to that is let's don't blame God about it. What we have to do is that we have to blame man because God gave to man something that sets him apart from all of the other of his created order, and that is he gave him choice. Man has the power to choose or not to choose, that is to reject even God himself. Now, a lot of the things that happen in the earth, these terrible things that we've just described right here, come about because man has made certain choices along the line. And now we want to blame God for them. I want to tell you something. God could stop all expression of evil in the world in an instant. He could stop all wars. He could stop all hunger. He could stop all the crime. He could stop all the involvement with drugs and all the hell that that lets loose on earth. But to do that, he would have to exert a sovereign will that would take away your choice. Now, one day he's going to do that. In the new heaven and the new earth, there's not going to be any hunger. There's not going to be any wars or even rumors of wars. In fact, the Bible says they're going to lay down their swords. They're not going to take them, but they're going to turn them into plows and, and uh, their spears into pruning hooks. There's not going to be all of these horrible effects of evil and sin because we are not going to have choice. Our choices will all have been made. And in reality, the only choice, the only two choices that we have to make are to choose God or to reject God. And when we get to that final state, That'll be the only thing that's there, the result of one of those two choices. So we've got to make sure that when we, when we represent God to the atheists, to the agnostics, to the humanists, that we're representing God in a proper way. You know, one of the ways that an atheist finds to attack our position is that he distorts our position, sets up a straw man, knocks it down, and then claims that he's proved something. Well, a lot of times I think we have misrepresented God. Uh, you know, when uh, somebody, you know, here's a person who's bowed down with care, as Job was, for instance, and his friends came and said, oh, you must have done something horrible. Why don't you confess it? And this goes on for chapter after chapter after chapter. And Job is reeling from the blows of his well-intentioned but uh, uh, bad-acting friends, and uh, finally, he, in fact, most of the time during the book of Job, he's saying, oh, God, tell them I'm right and they're wrong. I'm not as bad as they say I am. But it's, it's awfully tempting when something bad happens to someone to say, well, you know, God's getting you. God's going to get you. We tell our children that sometimes. You know, God's, gonna, not, God's not going to like that. God's, God's, well, there's a lot of things God doesn't like, but let him tell us. Uh, 
Let's don't put God, the fear of God, like we put the fear of policemen in kids sometimes. I heard a parent the other day in the store that said, if you don't be good, I'm going to tell that cop over there and he's going to come and get you. Well, that hardly uh, builds any kind of confidence in the, in the law-keeping segment of higher society or the, or, the, or the policeman. And I think we've done that to God a lot of times. We've told people, well, if you keep on doing that, God's going to get you. Well, he may, but God wants to redeem us. And we don't do God a favor by giving a wrong impression of him out there. In fact, I think a lot of the attacks upon God are not so much attacks on him as they are attacks on the wrong kind of perceptions that we've given of God out there in the world. Of course, many of these people, they don't need for us to give them a wrong perception. They've developed their own wrong perceptions. And uh, they think everybody believes that about God. I don't know how many times recently I've read in popular magazines or in uh, thoughtful journals uh, an attack upon some perception of God by a humanist or, or a non-believer. Uh, and he assumes that that's what Christians believe. He says, this is what you all believe. And that's not so at all. I don't believe that, never did believe it. And so we have to set the record straight. We have to make sure that our, our idea is right. Now, what about the origins of evil? Well, and this is a question. Where did it begin? Of course, that's connected with this whole question of the problem of evil. Well, we don't know exactly. We know that there was a fall of one of the archangels, Lucifer. We don't know when that fall occurred. We don't know whether it occurred back before the creation of the universe or whether it occurred in some period of time shortly after. We know that by the time uh, the serpent, which is the physical manifestation of Satan, of Lucifer, comes into the garden, that of course he is in his fallen state and he's trying to bring mankind down also. So it occurred somewhere before the creation of man. Now let's take a look in Isaiah chapter 14. We have several passages in the scripture that speak almost cryptically about Satan and about his origins. We're not really sure. In fact, theologians are divided about whether these are really descriptions about Satan uh, or Lucifer or who they are. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth. You who have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will, and these are the so-called five I wills which asserted the rebellious nature of Satan. You said in your heart, or really there an exhibition of the fundamental sin, which was pride. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will, ascend, uh, uh, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the Most High. And then the alternative or the consequence, nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home, and so on and so on. Now there's another passage in Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 28, beginning with verse 11, that some feel like applies, although it starts out uh, talking about the king of Tyre. In fact, one of the uh, great conservative uh, commentaries on the Old Testament does not even mention this passage as having any application to Satan or to Lucifer himself. It sounds like it ought to be because of several uh, applications here, but let's read it. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up the lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of the Lord. Every precious stone was your covering the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazula, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets, was in you on the day that you were created. They were prepared. 
You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And he goes on and talks more about that. Now, in any kind of exegesis of this, Hebrew is a very unusual language. It's quite different from Greek, quite different from any other languages, with the exception of those Semitic languages, Akkadian and others, that surround uh, the Hebrew language. It's more a language of, of the point. It's a language of large concepts, of ultimate causes, broad sweep of understanding. And sometimes we require of the Hebrew language of the text a, an exactitude, a technical exactitude that it does not carry. It's quite different from Greek in that respect. We'll get into that in a later teaching. Uh, and I think to try to exegete this, and especially what we know of Hebrew of that period, and uh, bring it down to these kinds of details, it does start off talking about the king of Tyre. In some sense, the king of Tyre was used as an instrument of satanic force. I think that's probably the way uh, many of these conservative scholars would exegete this. Uh, but if you want to believe it's Satan and Lucifer, that's fine. Uh, it's certainly true that he has uh, a lot to do with this. The text right here is somewhat corrupt in, in whatever what we have. And if you read different translations, you find different uh, words that are used here in some of the key verses verses. But suffice it to say that pride and vanity are the cause of Satan's fall. We don't know exactly. Uh, my guess would be, in the light of other passages, that this occurred sometime before the creation of the universe, that there was a prior creation in which God created angelic forces, uh, among them the archangels, among them Lucifer. And at some point, in his o'erweening pride, he mounted up and tried to establish a position that God had not given him, and as a result, he, he fell, and he fell because of pride. Now, of course, we're clear about the origin of evil and of sin in man, and it began in the garden. And we have to see that, that Adam was unlike any other man, despite some theologians since that time who want to see him as, as uh, every man is just like Adam. But nevertheless, Adam was indifferent. There was no sin prior to his creation, that is, in, in man. He wasn't created in sin. He was created as innocent potential. Now, that's the way I would describe the perfection in which Adam was said to have been created. He was not created perfect in any completed sense. He was created perfect potential, and he had to be tested. And God had in mind putting Adam through a series of tests concerning his own will, that is God's will. And as he passed these tests, he would be drawn closer into his full potential. Well, you know the sad story. The very first test that came to Adam, he failed. And as a result, uh, he fell into sin. And that sin has affected all of the race. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But this was a sin of rebellion and independence. God said, Adam, you can eat of any tree or any of the fruit of the garden except one tree. Just stay away from that one. And that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, let me submit something to you. Why should Adam want to know whether something was good or evil or not? You see, if you're perfectly obedient to God, You'll trust in what God says, and you won't need to know whether something is good or whether it's evil. You'll just do what God says, and you'll know that'll be the right thing at all points. When I was a boy, and now and again my mother would come home from the grocery store, because I was raised during the Depression, and we didn't get too many sweets or too many nice things, you know, real, uh, real nice things to eat from time to time. It was pretty plain fare. But every now and then she'd bring a little piece of fruit or something or candy, and she'd come in the door, and she'd set the sacks down, and she'd say, all right, Frank, you open your mouth and close your eyes. Well, I'd do that, and she'd put a piece of candy in there, a grape. Uh, 
My sister, who's three years younger than I am, she saw this going on, and one day she came up behind me, and she said, Frank, open your mouth and close your eyes. Well, you better believe, if you knew my sister, I wasn't about to do that. Uh, I didn't trust her intentions. She might have put a mud ball in my mouth or something like that. Well, you see, it's a matter of trust. And God operates on that fashion. You don't need to know whether something is good or bad if God says do it. But so often we want to know whether it's good, whether this is a good, and that means our judgment of whether it's good or it's evil before we will decide we're going to do it. And we miss out on following God because we've allowed that sort of syndrome to fill our hearts and minds. And this was Adam's problem. God said, eat of every tree, but he said, no, I want to do that. I want to be independent. I want to make my independent choices. And interestingly enough, when man opted to choose that, the irony of the whole situation from thenceforth, every man who came into the world, including Adam, could only choose the wrong. He was incapable of choosing the right until God provided a, a righteous substitute, until God provided an atonement. So it's interesting about choice. Now, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of speculation through the ages. There's a recent book um, in what's called the Doorway Papers, a series of books on very, rather interesting biblical subjects, in which it has been, the idea has been promulgated that there was an actual genetic infection that passed into the genes of Adam because it seems as though the sin has been passed through the male seed throughout all the generations. Mary herself was immune from that. It's one of the reasons why Jesus uh, did not fall under that same curse of original sin was because he was born of Mary, not of Joseph. The male uh, sperm or impregnation was granted by the Holy Spirit, not by a human man. And so Jesus escaped the curse. The implication there, and from some other passages that we see, uh, which emphasize the male sperm throughout Scripture, is that in some way there was an infection that came into humankind, and every man that's been born of the flesh came into that uh, spiritual infection. I won't get into the, all of the ramifications of it, but in another session I will get the book that deals with this and give you some other recommendations as far as that's concerned. But suffice it to say that sin, when it came in, it infected the whole race at its fountainhood. In fact, as we get on a little bit later on into the atonement and we talk about original sin, we realize that Adam is the federal head of the race. He affected all that came after him. And Jesus Christ was the antidote to that as the second Adam. Now, let's move from a discussion of the nature of evil to a more specific application of it, and that is the nature of sin. I think it's very important. Uh, I see that we don't talk much about sin today. In fact, in our culture, in our humanistic culture, we have developed a number of synonyms for sin. They're not really synonymous with the meaning of it, but they're just... Uh, there are ways to avoid really talking about sin. But we talk about mistakes, you know, social mistakes, and all so sorts of things like that. We trivialize, the mean we gut the meaning of sin. We call it social error. And the various theologies, liberation theology, feminist theology, have their own idea about what sin is. Now, sins in the process they become crimes, and that means that the state now is in charge of sin. Sins become sickness, and that means we treat them instead of making people responsible for them. Alcoholism, I'm sure there's something of a sickness about it, but in the original sense, it is a sin. It's a crime. We ought to call it sin, uh, but we avoid it by calling it a sickness. We avoid sin by calling it a crime. And that takes personal responsibility off. So we get all involved in the courts. We get all involved in the, in the police state. And uh, we blame the policemen for, for uh, stopping us. Uh, then, then we get into collective irresponsibility. 
Society is to blame. I robbed that store because, you know, I, I didn't have anything when I was young. And uh, I don't have a job, so I robbed it. Well, I can understand robbing, you know, stealing food. If you're about to starve or your family is about to starve, you're going to pay the consequences of it. But nevertheless, I can understand that. But I don't understand the kind of gratuitous theft and, you know, the idea that what's yours is mine that seems to pervade so much of society today. But uh, we have done a number of things to dislocate the thrust of the fact that every man is a sinner. You sin not because of your social or cultural climate. You sin because you're a human being and it's in your genes. A child does not have to be taught to sin. He doesn't have to grow up in terrible surroundings to sin. He's going to do it I don't care what. Now, it's sort of like uh, flour. I remember a number of years ago, I visited a, a, a factory in which they brought in wheat in, in box cars or these tank cars, and it was one of the, I think it was one of the large, uh, I think it was a Pillsbury factory or, or a yeah, factory or laboratory where they brought in wheat. And uh, the man that I was visiting was one of the scientists there, and he had to inspect every batch of wheat uh, to see whether it had, you know, what it had in it. You know, if we could see really what's in a lot of the food we eat and what the government permits, you know, we probably wouldn't, we wouldn't eat anything anymore. But a certain number, you know, there are bugs in it and various other things. And so what they looked for, and they took a, a sampling of every batch that came in, they heated it up in the ovens, and then they examined it in the microphone or the microscope, and they noticed... They, they would have a certain percentage of allowable refuse in that wheat before they'd pass it to go on to the bakeries. And um, I was amazed. I guess I probably should have thought about it. Uh, but, you know, I always thought that if you have your flour on a shelf in the pantry that you have to seal it up uh, and then the bugs won't get in it. But he said that's not the case. He said it comes with them. It's part of the package. There are eggs in there uh, that are microscopically seen. You can't see them necessarily with a naked eye, and they're just in there. And you can seal that package all you want, but it's going to turn bad sooner or later. There's going to get weevils in it. And you can seal it. You can hermetically seal it, but it's got within itself all of that corruption that soon under certain conditions are going to spring out, and you'll have weevils and other kind of little bugs and crawly things in there no matter what you do. Well, that's sort of like the human being. Uh, in fact, it's, it's there in them. It's born in us. Uh, and the reason we know that is because every man sins. And there's never been a person who's not sinned. We say, well, why should I be responsible for something that Adam did? Well, I'll discuss that with you or to, with anybody who has never sinned themselves. And I never met anybody like that, so the question is irrelevant. But we'll talk about that just a little bit later. But let's do a little study of the word sin and the words in the Bible that talk about it, and then we'll get to what is sin, what does it amount to. Now, let the word study here, first of all, there is the word uh, hamartia, and we'll get to, the, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit, uh, a little bit more about it in just a moment. Hamartia, which means to miss the mark, and then there's adakia, And this, by the way, dikaius is the word for righteousness. And this meaning not righteousness, that means uh, an unrighteousness or iniquity. It's translated very often in the King James by iniquity. Then we have poneria. which means a viciousness a degenerate kind of evil, the worst kind. And then we have uh, parabasis. These are all words in Greek that are used uh, in the Bible that are translated in these various ways. Uh, parabasis, and that means to trespass. Paul talks about the trespasses. We are dead in trespasses and sins. And then there is, and I'm running out of space up here. Let me get my eraser. Uh, there's anomia, anomia, which comes from ah there, and nomia or nomos, which means a law, 
which means lawlessness. And these are the main words that are used in the New Testament, in New Testament Greek, to uh, talk about the various aspects of sin. Now, what is sin? Well, the very first thing theologically that I want to say about sin is that it is separation from God. And that's the most fundamental thing, the most foundational thing that I can say about sin. Because sin has to do with our relationship with God. When Adam sinned in the garden, what he did is he stepped aside from his relationship with God. He broke that covenant relationship. And uh, somebody said it was the breaking of the line, of the telephone line. He lost communication with God. Before that time, Adam had a marvelous opportunity to fellowship with God in the garden. You know, every evening God would come down and he and Adam would walk in the garden, this beautiful garden, marvelous place for man to fit the, and to meet his every need. And I don't know what they talked about, probably, you know, whether they, what they had named the animals during the day. Um, whatever they talked about, it was marvelous fellowship. And when Adam sinned, he lost that communication, that direct communication with God, and the communication ever since has been somewhat cloudy. When Jesus Christ came, of course, that was the greatest manifestation of the nature of, of God that we had ever seen. But nevertheless, it is separation from God. Now, it's interesting that David, when he sinned against Bathsheba, and this is a tremendous theological truth, uh, in the 11th chapter of uh, 1 Samuel, you know that's a record of, uh, of, uh, of David's sin there, 2 Samuel, I'm sorry. And uh, Psalm 51 is the psalm that is the outpouring, the repentant outpouring. If you want to know about repentance, read Psalm 51. Because when Nathan put his bony finger into David's face and said, Thou art the man there started a process that God and the Spirit of God was involved in, and the culmination of it was in Psalm 51. And David cried out unto God, trying to come into some kind of repentance and restoration. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Now this is the part I want you to hear, verse 4. David says this, Against thee, thee only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in thy sight. Now that's rather strange, because if you know the story, you know that David, uh, looking out from uh, the top of his castle, uh, or his, his place of residence one day, saw this beautiful woman sunbathing on, on the roof of her house. And she was a married woman, and you know the rest of the story. He decided to uh, strike up a relationship with her. Only one problem, her husband was in the way, so he sent him out, had him killed, and then he possessed the woman. And as a result, the rest of the story of David is a downhill uh, trip. Uh, Second Samuel may be graft something uh, like a, a tent. The first 11 chapters up to the 22 chapters in the book, the first 11 chapters uh, is on the rise. You know, David's uh, situation is fine. Then the sin with Bathsheba at the peak, and from there on, everything slides downward in his personal life and in his, and in his kingdom. Now, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah, her husband. He sinned against the nation. He sinned against himself. But he comes in here in his repentance. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. And that is a profound theological understanding of sin. You know, there are a lot of people today who think, well, you know, sin is just if you hurt somebody else. Uh, friend, that's the least of your problems. If you don't understand, there's no true repentance are turning away from sin until you understand that sin is first and foremost against God. And if you don't get God's, uh, if you don't get His forgiveness, uh, then there's nothing else going to happen. Now, you might straighten out some of your affairs and your relationships on a human level. But the most important thing, and David understood this. This is why he was a man after God's own heart. 
because he understood the true theological and biblical nature of repentance, and that was that sin was against God. It's more than a violation of rules. It's more, it, it's really an expression of rebellion and independence from God. It goes back to the original thing. It's a breaking of a covenantal relationship. All right, in the second case, sin, and I mentioned it earlier, is a missing of the mark. Now, this is the word that Paul uses a lot in Romans in talking about sin, hamartia. It also he uses it in Philippians 3, 14, uh, talking about the mark, the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Romans, he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is another way of saying you've missed the mark. It's not that you do bad things. It's not that you don't do good things. It's that you've missed the mark. God requires that we, uh, that we be aiming for the mark of the prize of the glory of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And when you miss the mark, what you do, you miss Jesus Christ. And if you miss him, you miss everything else. And that's what he means by that. So that word hamartia means you've missed it. You've missed the mark. And for salvation or to be on right terms with God, you've got to hit the mark. There is no close. Close only comes in horseshoes and something else that I can't remember at the moment. But nevertheless, you can't miss it. You can't even have a, you've got to, you've got to have a ringer, and that is uh, to shoot for the mark. Now, another thing about sin, talking about its nature, is that it is a basic principle in all of mankind. You know, I think this is, this is one of the chief failings of many liberal and humanistic schemes. I think it's a problem with some forms of Christian theology. It, it surely is in many cases. And that is, we do not reckon with the radical nature of evil and the propensity for sin in the human life. And so you have all these fancy schemes about how we're going to bring heaven on earth, this unparalleled period of peace and prosperity. And there have been schemes since the beginning. Plato had his republic in which he gave the ideal government or nation. Uh, the only problem, if you read that, you realize that his careful orchestrating of the way people were going to relate together was going to fall apart. Why? Because there is in man an innate nature which includes sin, sin against his own good nature and sin against one another. And it just won't work. In Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 43 and 45, we find some expression of this. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Now in Ephesians 2, 3, Paul says, Among them, talking about to, to the Christian, to Christians at Ephesus, he said, uh, Among the Gentiles, the, the, the original, the lost people, Among them we too all former lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul is saying that Christians, you, didn't, you weren't born that way. You were just like the rest of them out there. You were children of wrath when you were born, and there was something as a basic principle in mankind. Now, another thing about sin and its nature is that it also is composed of separate acts of disobedience. Not only is it a principle that's worked deeply into our lives, but it is also separate acts of disobedience. In uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, uh, verse 20, uh, he says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. In 1 Kings 8, 46, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, he says, When they sin against thee, for there is no man who does not sin, 
and thou art angry with them, and dost deliver them to the enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Of course, what we're interested in is that little parenthesis. There is no man who doth not sin. Of course, in Isaiah, he said, For all have sinned and come short. Uh, he says, They all have turned to their own way. There is none righteous, no, not one. In fact, he says, For the natural man, even the good things that he does, all our righteousness, our own self-produced, humanistically uh, produced righteousness is as a bunch of filthy, dirty rags. That doesn't sound very promising for any schemes to promote goodness among mankind on earth. Now, in the last case, sin is universal and is species-wide. I put this in here because a number of years ago, I was, when I was in college, I was taking a course in general psychology. And there was a young a man who was working on his doctorate, he had his master's degree, and he was the instructor in the class. And we got in one section where he was talking about instinct. And the definition of an instinct is a behavior or an act that is universal and species-wide. That means if you talk about the instinct of birds, then all birds, all particular birds, have to act in this way. For instance, the homing instinct among pigeons or whatever. And we got to talking about it, and he said, you know, there really aren't any instincts if you use that definition of them. And we started talking about all of the various instincts of mankind, and we got to the maternal instinct. And somebody said, well, what about the maternal instinct? Isn't that universal and species-wide? He said, no, there are too many examples of mothers who don't treat their children right. Now, of course, this was many years ago, 40 years ago, uh, in which there weren't as many examples of horrendous failures of motherhood as there are today. We didn't have the dope scene as we do now and a number of other things. But it is a universal thing. Every it, And I wanted to say at the time, in fact, I brought it up and it was really jumped on by the class, but I brought I said, I believe I know an instinct that is universal and species-wide. And he said, what is that? And I said, uh, well, it's the, it's the tendency to sin. And oh, if you ever say the word sin in a psychology class, you're in trouble right off. And I was in a heap of trouble. He said, what do you mean by sin? Well, I had to give a scriptural definition of sin. Well, we don't understand that. We don't, we don't, that, well, that's not sin, uh, you know, and we, went, we got around in hassles. But I believed it at that point, and I believe there may be no other instinct among humankind. There may be some others, but there may be none, but there is that one that every human being who's ever lived has an instinct to sin, and it's universal, and it's species-wide. In Proverbs 20, verse 9, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9. Some I seem to turn to very quickly, and others I can't. <clears throat> Who can say, he says, this is a rhetorical question, who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure from my sin? It's very clear that the writer here doesn't indicate that there's anybody who can say that. Romans 3 and 10. Romans 3, chap uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, Paul has a lot to say about sin, the sin principle. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands uh, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep, and he goes on. It gets worse and worse. So Paul is completely convinced of uh, what Luther later was to call, or Calvin later was to call, the utter depravity of man. All right, let's talk about some of the aspects of sin now before we go on. And I want to say, make this statement, that the core of sin is unbelief. In Genesis 3, it's surely a sign of unbelief. In Acts 7, it talks about the failure of the children of Israel. And the failure was due to their unbelief. Romans 14, 23 mentions this same thing. Romans 14, chapter 14, verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatsoever is not from faith is sin. So that covers a wide. If you don't believe, believe in the scriptural sense, 
then whatever else you do, for whatever reason you do it, it's done on the basis of sin. So the core of sin is unbelief. Adam sinned because he wouldn't believe God. Because God said, do this. He said, I'll do something else. Now, along with sin goes hardness of heart and rebellion. It's a, it's a core reaction. The core of sin is unbelief. And when you begin to believe, un, disbelieve God, and it's very clear from the history of the children of Israel in the, as they went through the wilderness and in the land, that when they d didn't believe God, the next thing that happened was a hardness of heart that set in. And then when they had an opportunity to follow God, they turned away in rebellion. Hebrews 3.12 says it better than anything I could say. Take care is the warning. Why? Lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, some of the chief manifestations of sin. Of course, the primary manifestation of sin, the, I should say the initial manifestation of sin was that of pride. It was the sin that brought Lucifer down. It was the fundamental sin, the pride of life, pride of the eyes, so forth as the scriptures talk about. And that's what really involves us in the life of sin. It's the chief manifestation of it. Pride in ourselves. The outstanding characteristic of the humanist, of the man without God, is that of pride. He's proud of his own, of his own abilities. He's proud of his own accomplishments. Even sometimes when he's living in degradation and evil of the vilest sort, there is a certain pride uh, about him. Now, another thing is sensuality. When you begin to fall into sin, uh, sensuality comes. God has a lot to say about adultery in the Old Testament. He's talking about not only physical adultery, but spiritual adultery. And when they began to go after other gods, it wasn't long before it was connected immediately with sensuality. Now, another thing that characterizes sin is that of fear. When you delve down deep enough into the heart and the mind and the spirit of a man who's living in sin, there is a fear at the bottom of it. There's an anxiety that cannot be explained. In fact, I believe it's this fear, not the consequences of pride, not the consequences of sexuality or sensuality, but this fear that will drive a man away from sin and back to God so often. The Holy Spirit uses that. And uh, if there is a fear in your heart, there's a trembling in there, uh, perhaps for fear of judgment, I don't know, then that's a sign you need to get back on the track. It's a sign of the presence of sin in your life. The Bible says that perfect love casteth out all fear. And we may assume that if perfect love casteth out fear, then if there is an absence of this perfected love, which is Jesus Christ there, or an absence of his manifestation, then fear is going to creep in. In fact, I think with a lot of Christians, I think that's who fall off the track, I think fear comes in, in, in various ways to, to bring them apart. Now, uh, another aspect of sin is that it is personal and it's social. And so are the consequences of sin. You know, a lot of people believe that sin is probably social, but they don't want to really believe that it's personal. But it's both. And the consequences are there. And in fact, the cross is a symbol of these two consequences of sin. Let me just draw a picture of it up here in, in some way to illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, the cross is the antidote for our sin, and the cross is the symbol of the two directions of our relationships, the two directions that we need clean, we need cleansing. So the upright indicates our relationship with God. And if we're in a state of sin, that needed to be corrected. The other, the, uh, the horizontal, represent our relationships with others. And the truth of the matter is that if you've got problems with God and you're in a state of rebellion against God, you're going to have problems with other people. If you've got problems with other people, you, by definition, you have problems with God. And uh, these are the personal consequences. You have to deal with those first. You see, that's the problem with people who have problems in their lives. They come to a counselor and they want to get straightened out. You see, here's a husband and wife who come and they say, 
well, you know, we're just not getting along together. Can you give us a book to read or can you counsel us to get straightened out with our problems this way? We used to say when they came into our counseling program in the church that I pastored in Louisville, say, no, uh, you have to get straight with God first because, you see, if you're going to erect a cross, the two pieces of a cross, you have to erect the upright first. You can't just float that out there in the, uh, you know, in the ether, in the air. And so, you, you know, I could probably tell them some things. If you'll do this, you know, you'll kind of get straightened out, but it's temporary. Unless we have our relationship right with God, our personal relationship with God, we don't stand a chance of working out a spiritual relationship, one that's effective and that's eternal with the people that are around us. So any kind of counseling has, have to be, has, has to be what we call cross-centered. Uh, don't try to straighten out people's lives without straightening out their relationship with God. It won't work. There's no power in it. There's nothing of an eternal and divine nature that's involved in the situation. And in fact, very often, I judge whether or not uh, any kind of human situation is, has any promise to it or not by whether there is the work and the power of God that you can see. Is God working in that thing? Is God doing anything in the people's lives? And if he's not, then you don't stand a chance of working out their social or their horizontal relationships. But if he is working, uh, I often say to people who come in to counsel me, you know, so, well, I don't, you know, so well, he doesn't trust me. I say, well, I don't either. So what do you mean you don't trust me? Some of my children used to say that. They say, you don't trust me. I said, no, I don't. I don't trust anybody. I trust the presence of God in a life. It's the only thing that you can put any power or put any, put any pressure on. Uh, it's the only thing that can be a foundation for life is the presence of God in someone's life. Everything else is up for grabs. Everything else in our lives, we can't even depend upon ourselves. What do you mean? I can't trust in myself, but I can trust in the living God. And so sin is personal and it has consequences. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about those kinds of consequences and the fact that some sins seem greater than others. Would you agree to that? Well, why do they agree? Or why are they? Or should we fall in the Roman Catholic uh, idea of uh, relegating the sins to certain levels? And one requires a little bit more uh, penance than another? Uh, well, I think there are differences, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Now, finally, the effects of sin in the first case are moral and spiritual bondage. Moral and spiritual. Throughout the Bible, the whole story of the Bible, the whole narrative of the Bible shows that sin, no matter who commits it, no matter what their status was before, brings them into a bondage. The more you sin, the more you don't deal with your sin, the scriptures are abundantly clear, your choices are limited more and more. Your sin limits you. Righteousness expands a man's possibilities, his potential. Sin continually limits him in that respect. It brings him into spiritual bondage. Take the example that I mentioned a moment ago of David, King David, who had every potential in the world a man after God's own heart, the popular choice of the people. And yet after his sin, uh, he was reduced uh, to an old man just trembling in a bed waiting to die, his whole family awry. The kingdom rested out of his, out of his hands in, in certain ways. There was a split in the kingdom at the close uh, of his life or close of his son's life. And so... He, was, he fell into bondage over it. Solomon the same way. The sins of Solomon with all of the wives and the idolatry that he brought in by means of that into his kingdom represented it wound up in the destruction of the United Kingdom there. Now another effect of sin is that of guilt. You know there's been a tremendous effort to absolve people of guilt today. I remember a number of years ago uh, beginning to minister to a woman after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she came and she'd been under psychiatric care. And the treatment of all the shock treatments and everything else was to remove a sense of guilt from her. And they made a zombie out of her. And I, when we began to minister in the power of the Spirit to this woman, it took us several years for us to come to a full understanding or a full treatment 
uh, of just constant ministry to her by the body of Christ there in that place. My wife and I ministered to her on numerous occasions. And I remember when we started that process, I said, what right do I have to stir? She's gotten rid of this terrible, a lot of it, of course, was inappropriate guilt. It was more condemnation. But I realized that guilt was absolutely necessary for her. It's necessary for all of us. You know, it's the pain sensation of the soul. I have a finger here that I put a drill through a number of years ago, several years ago, wrapped up all the nerves in it, and I don't have a lot of feeling in it. Now, it was near one of the burners on the stove the other day. I didn't realize it, and I smelled something, my finger burning. Uh, well, it was dangerous. Uh, and that pain feeling is necessary in our bodies to keep us out of danger. Guilt is necessary. It is what God has given us to indicate we're in sin, we're doing the wrong thing. And it's absolutely necessary. I heard some uh, inane statement made by one of the uh, uh, comics on a Johnny Carson show one night, and he thought he had said something profound. Everybody oohed and awed over it. But he made this statement. He said, the only sin is guilt. Well, he fell right in line with a common uh, attempt today to remove guilt from people. If we can get, get, get guilt out of their lives, then they'll be all right. No, they won't. They'll be just like me with my finger that doesn't feel when, and I could, I could have burned that finger off, could have had serious infection, died from it. Well, you can die from the effects of sin in your life. And so guilt is very important. And then finally, death and hell are the effects of sin. We're going to go on with this teaching in the next session. But let me just read to you from James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 in closing. And this is the final effects of sin. No matter how its effects are put off during our life, uh, finally, that is the final result of sin. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And, of course, we know where that winds up also. Well, fortunately, we are not of those of the night or the darkness. We are those of the day. But we need to understand the effects of sin in our lives, even as Christians. And so we'll get into that the next time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that there is a way out of the age-old uh, problem of the human race, that we don't have to be bound by the forces of evil, nor do we have to be condemned by the effects of our own sin. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the enabling work of the Holy Spirit that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that. We bless you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray, who has made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. In His name we pray. Amen.